Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me. And on behalf of the Attorney General, I want to thank you. Um, as you've heard, I've, been, I've worn many hats over the years. I've been a reporter, and I've been an attorney on the other side, litigating these cases and responding to public records requests. Um, so I've been in your shoes. And I uh, thought we would hit the highlights of the act today, talk about a couple scary things, and then um, I'll take some questions. So the Public Records Act, like our Open Meetings Act, are often uh, called transparency laws or sunshine laws. And that comes from US Supreme Court Justice William Brandeis, who once famously said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So that phrase, uh, sunshine laws, comes from a case. And it's essentially transparency builds public confidence in government. When people can see what their government's doing, they feel confident that their um, tax money is being spent wisely, and they know what's going on. Our Open Public Records Act was passed in 1972, it was initiative 276, so it was passed by the people, not the legislature, 72% of the popular vote. It used to be codified in 4217, for those who've been around for a while, remember that, it's now in RCW 4256. Um, interestingly, it predates uh, Watergate. A lot of states' open records laws, FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act, kind of came about as a result of the Watergate scandal, ours predated that. So we've been a leader in this area for a long time. The Act says right there, the people do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them, serve them. The people in delegating their authority do not give public servants the right to decide what is good for them to know and not good for them to know. And they insist on remaining informed. So they retain control over the instruments they've created. It's right there in the Act. The Act also provides that the free and open examination of public records is in the public interest, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment to public officials or others. The Act is to be liberally construed. You can imagine when it first passed, there were some early court challenges, and our state Supreme Court um, famously upheld the, the vast majority of the Act, which not only had public records disclosure, it also had campaign finance disclosure, and it had lobbying disclosure. That was all in Initiative 276. And in upholding the vast majority of that, our state Supreme Court said, it's been said time and again in our history by political and other observers that an informed and active, active electorate is the essential ingredient, if not the sine qua non, the indispensable action in regard to a socially effective and desirable continuation of our democratic form of government. So, even our Supreme Court has said the people need the information in order so they can govern themselves. So the way our act works is much like other public records act around the country. The presumption is the records are open. So that's where you start. Then you only go from there to see what the law allows in terms of processing or withholding information. And in our state, they can only be withheld if there's an exemption in law. So an agency can't decide on its own to withhold something unless it can tie it to a law. And those exemptions are narrowly construed. Our act applies to records of state government agencies, local government agencies, and in a limited extent to the legislature. It also applies to agencies that may meet certain criteria and they're the functional equivalent, if you will, of public agencies. The act does not apply to court records. There's court rules that govern access to court records and to private organizations or persons. So once a week, at least, I get a phone call does the Public Records Act apply to homeowners associations? No, it does not. Lots going on in homeowners associations, but the act doesn't cover them. Our act is a very broad description of public record. It has two parts. First, the definition. It means any writing containing information relating to the conduct of government or the performance of any governmental or proprietary function. And this is an, these are important verbs here. Prepared, owned, used, or retained by any state or local agency, regardless of physical form or, or characteristic. It says any writing, and writing is also broadly defined. Handwriting, typewriting, printing, photostatting, photographing, and every other means of recording any form of communication. And then it goes on from there to give a list. Remember the era in which this was written. The vast majority of records at that time were paper. Yet this definition continues to have viability today, and you can see how broadly defined it is. Note, public records can include, as you heard earlier, records of agency business when they are created or retained by agency employees or officials on home computers or in non-agency email accounts. And I'm going to talk a little bit later on about personal devices because that is, of course, 
the next iteration in the, in the litigation. So the Act sets out a list of procedures that every agency must follow. Um, and this is whether you're a state agency or a local agency. So for example, you have to appoint a public records officer. You have to describe certain procedures about how your agency is organized and operates and what its rules and procedures are. With respect to public records requests, you need to adopt rules or procedures that provide full public access to public records, protect them from damage or disorganization, prevent excessive interference with other agency functions, provide the fullest assistance to requesters. And the courts go back to that phrase all the time, <coughs> fullest assistance. Um, they don't want agencies to be roadblocks you know, to getting records. And provide the most timely possible action on requests. If agencies charge, copy for, uh, charge a fee for copies, they need to publish a fee schedule. If an agency believes there are laws that exempt some or all of their records, they need to um, provide a list of that. And they need to make sure that the records are available for inspection and copying during customary business hours for a minimum of 30 hours a week. And under some recent law changes, you need to post those hours on your website and make it known by other public means. So a person who wants a record uh, also has certain requirements they must follow, certain steps. A person can request an identifiable public record from agencies. So the records have to be something you can identify so that you can go search for it and produce it, obviously. Um, a requester can use an agency's public records request form. I recommend you have those forms available. Um, if the agency request form is not used, a requester must provide fair notice that he or she is seeking public records. So a request for information is not a request for records under the Act. So if someone emails you or calls you and says, tell me how you process X, that's not a public records request. That's a request for information. If someone says, I want all records that show how you process X, you may need to clarify if, you, if the phrase processing X you don't understand, but that's a public records request. Okay? It's for identifiable records. Requesters can ask to inspect. They don't have to ask for copies, so they can come in and look at them. Or, but more commonly, typically people do want copies of records, and, and typically now they want them electronically. Mm -hmm. Does that request, even though they stepped into the office or called you, do they need to submit that request in writing? Um, the question is whether they need to submit the request in writing. What the courts have said is oral requests are problematic. Um, because you might not have a meeting of the minds. So what I suggest and I recommend is if they hand them the form or ask them to write it out, if they do not want to do that, then I would at minimum fill out the form for them, date it, and then provide it to them and say, this is what we understand your request to be, and get them to clarify it if, if in fact it's not correct, or to confirm it if it is correct. So you need a contemporaneous document so the, it's your starting point for a conversation. So I really recommend, for, for some reason they've refused to fill out the form, fill it out for them, send it to them, hand it to them, make yourself a copy so you know what your starting point is. And agencies can adopt procedures explaining where requests must be submitted and other procedures. So for example, when I was at the Public Disclosure Commission, we adopted a rule that said there's only one email address that can be used for public records requests. So if you send it to any other agency email address, it will be considered a request for information. It will not be considered a public records request under the Act. And here were the reasons why. One was that one email address was checked every day. In fact, it was checked twice a day. So we knew you know, there wasn't you know, going to be a downtime because there's a time to respond. Secondly, people go on vacation. Okay? And sometimes they go on vacation more than five days. And thirdly, we checked that address, not only the email address, but also the junk mail folders. And every once in a while, a public records request is not identified because of something about the address as a public records request, and it might get so sitting in your junk mail folder. An agency has five business days to respond to a public records request by doing any one of a number of things. First, acknowledge receipt of the request and provide a reasonable estimate of time for further response, or fulfill it or provide an internet address and link to the records on the agency's website. That's a recent amendment in the law, which I really encourage you to put commonly requested records on your website. Um, and then you can just provide a link and boom, you're done. Um, seek clarification or deny the request. And if you deny the request, you have to have a written explanation as to the reason and the statutory basis. 
An agency can seek clarification of a request if it's not reasonably clear or does not seek identifiable records. But remember, the agency is to provide the fullest assistance. So if it's clear, you're not going to be following up to, to ask for clarification when you can tell that you, what records you want. If you can't tell, and that happens, sometimes people think they're asking for X and they say they're asking for Y, um, an agency should explain why it needs uh, clarification. Um, it's to provide assistance. We don't understand this phrase. You asked for a time period. Our agency didn't exist in those years. <laughs> you know? um, give the, the requester some basis to provide you that clarification. Under some recent amendments to law, if the requester does not respond, you can close out the request. You can provide an estimate of time for further response. Remember, that was one of the options. Um, the estimate is to be reasonable. Um, it's a good practice to briefly explain why you need more time. Um, maybe it's your agency's busiest time of the year. Maybe several staff are out. Maybe um, the type of request is a complicated one that has all kinds of information you may need to review with your lawyers. You might need to have time to assemble and review the records. You might need to provide notice to affected third persons. Um, and so it's a good reason, or it's a good business practice to explain briefly why. Um, you can extend the time if needed. Sometimes that happens. You think you're gonna, it's going to take you a week, and you roll up your sleeves, and you start diving into the records, and you realize this is not a week project. This is a month project um, or longer. So you can revise that estimate of time. If you can't produce all the records at once, the law does allow you to produce records in installments, um, and I really recommend that. You know, sort of get the low-hanging fruit out, get the records out that you can, even knowing you might need more time to process different parts of the request or have them uh, those records reviewed. Searches. This is a big area. This is a really big topic right now that the courts are very interested in, and so I need to bring this to your attention. Um, an agency should read the request carefully, obviously, so you know what you're looking for and to seek clarification. Um, you can ask the requester su to suggest search terms um, as one, one way to manage that. An agency must conduct an adequate search for responsive records. And remember, you need to consider all formats, paper and electronic, you just heard about that. Remember former employees, think of other locations, think of some of the new um, social media formats and others that are being used. What the courts have said is the search should be reasonably calculated to uncover responsive records and follow obvious leads to possible locations where records are likely to be found. Okay, that's the court saying that. Um, and so, for example, if you're looking at an email and five people are CC'd on there, you, you now got five other leads, right? So you're going to follow those up and, and search for those records. Remember, if this is challenged, the agency bears the burden of proof of showing that its search was adequate. So I recommend you document the search. You know, a year or two years from now, you're not going to remember where you looked or what search terms you used or whatever. So, so keep track of it so you can put that affidavit together later. In a recent case that came out just a few days ago, the court also said the, court, the search needs to be sincere. Okay, so it needs to be giving that fullest assistance. I mentioned that records can be provided in installments. That works particularly well for larger requests. Um, if someone's asking for copies, you can ask for a deposit of upfront of 10% of the cost of those copies. Um, installments can also include records that are on your website. So a first installment could be, here's links to the records on our website that are responsive to your request. Again, another reason to put commonly requested records on your website. Um, it also allows requesters then to decide if they do want to hit print um, from their own home computer, which ones do they want to print, and it saves them some time and money. So remember where records are presumed open. So on the flip side, if there are exemptions from disclosure, those are narrowly construed. Um, and in Washington, you have to have an exemption in law. Um, the general rule is you disclose the information and the parts of the records that are disclosable, and you withhold only those parts that are not. The exemptions can be listed both in the Public Records Act and in other laws. So for example, the Health Care Act, uh, health care laws are there's a whole body of law about health care records. Those are outside the Public Records Act. They're still an exemption. 
So if you are going to withhold the record, there's certain information the courts and the statutes say you need to provide. And the reason is you need to give the requester enough information to know whether they could go to court or should go to court or want to go to court to challenge it. So you need to describe the record by like date, type, author, total number of pages. You need to explain why, what the exemption is, so you list the statute, and give a brief explanation. These are attorney-client privilege records, uh, you know, part of litigation, that kind of thing. You can use an exemption log. Uh, you can use other formats, so long as all of their um, basic information is there. Common exemptions are um, student records. There are certain protections for student records. There are certain protections for some employment records, attorney-client privilege information. Um, healthcare information are sort of common areas. Um, agencies are not authorized in the Public Records Act to provide lists of individuals for commercial purposes. A lot of people think this means an agency can't pr provide records if they know it will be used for a business purpose. No. A business has a right to ask for records just like an individual. The only thing that's restricted is a list of individuals, real people. That's the only prohibition in the act. If an agency does cite an exemption, it bears the burden of proof. So again, if you go to court, it's the agency that must come forward and explain to the court, not the requester saying, I don't think it fits, or this exemption fits or doesn't fit. The agency must say, this is the reason it applies. There is no general privacy exemption in the Public Records Act. Um, there is, if Privacy is an element of another exemption, so you've got an exemption that has a component of privacy in it. Then, then your next step is to look at whether these two criteria are met, and both of them must be met. That release of the information would be highly offensive to the reasonable person and not of legitimate concern to the public. Okay. Both of those criteria must be met. Okay, um, so some people think there's a general privacy protection in the act, not, not necessarily. You have to go through this multi-step analysis. So the act does allow agencies to charge copies for fees, but not for people to inspect. So if someone wants to come in and inspect, there's no charge for that. Um, agencies can't charge for searching, reviewing, or redacting the, uh, records. Um, they cannot charge salaries, benefits, or general overhead or administrative costs unless those costs are related to the copying. And then they must be reasonable, and then you have to document how you came up with that number. Um, agencies can charge fees for the copies themselves. There's a default amount of 15 cents a page or actual cost. So for example, if you send it out to a vendor because there's big maps or it's a big project, you can pass along that actual cost to the requester. You can also pass along the cost of mailing containers, postage, that kind of thing. But you also need to have all of this available on your fee schedule. For some agencies, there are laws outside of the Public Records Act that have specific costs for certain types of records, vital records, death certificates, birth certificates, uh, that kind of thing. In our state, the courts enforce the Public Records Act. And if they find an agency violated, they can impose civil penalties. And if you've seen any of the headlines, some of these penalties have been quite large, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, a court is to consider certain factors in assessing the penalty, and I'm going to go through those in a minute. Um, the penalty can go from zero to $100, but there's factors that have to um, be looked at. But a court will award a prevailing requester their attorney's fees and costs. So even if there's no penalty, if they win, they get their attorney's fees and costs. There are special new penalty provisions for um, inmate requesters. The legislature heard about a um, number of concerns with that, and there's a special process now for that. So what our Supreme Court has said is a court, a trial court, and all the way up, back up to the Supreme Court, must consider these non-exclusive factors in assessing a penalty. So here are the factors that can reduce a penalty. So if your affidavits, your declarations, your explanations to court include this kind of information, that can help reduce the penalty. A lack of clarity in the Public Records Act request. So you've asked for clarification. They didn't provide it. You did your best you could. You provided the records you thought were responsive. The requester later says, nope, 
no, that's not what I wanted, this is what I wanted. Well, we tried to get them to clarify, and, and the request does not have clarity. The agency's prompt response or legitimate follow-up inquiry for clarification. The agency's good faith, honest, timely, and strict compliance with the Public Records Act procedural requirements and exceptions. Proper training and supervision of the agency's personnel on their obligations under the Act. The reasonableness of any explanation for noncompliance by the agency. The helpfulness of the agency to the requester and the existence of agency systems to track and retrieve public records. Always think of your communications with the requester, so your five-day letter, your follow-up letter, your request for clarification, your closure letter. I call those exhibits A, B, C, and D. And in there you should be using respectful, polite language. You know, you're, you're there to assist. And, and if a court looks at some tense emails, between you and the requester, that's really not going to help you in the long run. So on the flip side, the aggravating factors, so these are the things that can increase a penalty. A delayed response by the agency, especially in circumstances making time of the essence. Lack of strict compliance with the Public Records Act procedure requirements. Lack of proper training and supervision of the agency's personnel. Unreasonableness of the agency's explanation. Negligent reckless, wanton, bad faith, or intentional noncompliance with the act, agency dishonesty in, in providing the explanation to the court, the public importance of the issue to which the request is related, where the importance was foreseeable to the agency, any actual personal economic loss to the requester resulting from the agency's misconduct, where the loss was foreseeable to the agency. Pay attention to this one. A penalty amount necessary to deter future misconduct by the agency, considering the size of the agency and the facts of the case. A court can impose a penalty to send a message to your agency. And lastly, and this is a new one, the inadequacy of an agency's search for records. Remember that earlier slide on searches? The courts are paying attention to searches. Are you casting a wide enough net? Are you using the right search terms? Are you looking in the right locations? Because if you're not, that can be an aggravating factor to increase penalties. There are penalties outside the Public Records Act. Um, there is a law that provides that it's criminal liability for willful destruction or alteration of a public record. For state employees, there are also penalties under the ethics, uh, state ethics law. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about some evolving developments with respect to personal devices, home computers, that kind of thing, and, and some things that are in play right now um, in the courts, and we're kind of waiting to see what all develops. But up till now, uh, prior decisions have said that if an employee conducts business on a home computer, agency business, the records that person creates on that home computer can be subject to a public records act uh, request. And, and that can be expensive, because I mean, somebody's going to have to go find those, somebody's going to have to produce them, that kind of thing. That's been true for a few years now. Um, what is developing is the courts are now looking at a couple things. One is where, whether the uh, employee is accurate in saying that when it, he or she turns over records from their home computer, that's all the records that are responsive. For example, there's a case pending um, right now in the city of Bainbridge Island. <clears throat> uh, city of Bainbridge Island loses lawsuit over council member emails, judge rules. Judge rules officials violated public records act. The judge ordered the city to search the hard drives of the computers of the city council members saying the pair who had sued the city over missing public records, the plaintiffs, should be awarded their attorney's fees. The court ordered these city council members to turn over the hard drives of their computers and other electronic information that can show how the emails were created and sent, including the metadata. The hard drives of the home computers, not just the emails that were created and sent, the hard drives of the home computers. Um, this case is currently pending. I don't know where it's going to wind up. Um, you heard about the personal uh, website issue. Here's another headline. Uh, Puyallup City Council member ordered to release records tied to private website. Pierce County Superior Court judge cites clear abuses of Public Records Act. Again, this case is still pending. We don't know where it's going to wind up. There's appeals process that could, 
that can come into play. But lastly, here's another headline. Sides await ruling in Pierce County's cell phone case. This one's in the Court of Appeals. And the issue is whether a public employee who used his personal cell phone for making phone calls, but also sending text messages, whether those cell phone billing records, which the agency never used in terms of paying for it, they didn't process it, they didn't, nothing, but also the text messages, whether those are subject to the Public Records Act. And the concern in these cases of some of the courts and the open government um, supporters is that by not making those subject to the Public Records Act, you, you can open the opportunity for a shadow government, if you will, to be running on personal devices. On the other, side, on the other hand, the uh, people who use these devices have a privacy concern that just like um, government can't come into your home and start rummaging through your closets without a search warrant or something, the government should not come into your cell phone or to your home computer and start rummaging through it unless it has authority in law. And the question is, what is that authority in law and is consent required? Does an employee need to consent to that search? So these are the issues that are not resolved, um, but I throw a cautionary note to all of you out there if you use home devices or personal devices or home computers um, to be be mindful of where it could take you in respect to a not only a Public Records Act request, but a discovery request if there was litigation about it. Um, I put this slide up here mainly just to scare you, um, aside if you weren't already scared. Uh, for those folks who say, oh, I know how the Public Records Act works, and I, I understand the statutes, this is just a list of the bills that passed this session impacting public records. Um, I have this on our website, by the way. I've got a link to each of these. But you can see how active this area is, not only for the courts, but also for the legislature. So it's, it's incumbent for agencies to stay on top of the, the developments in the law, and, and in particular, the, the statutes that may affect their agency's types of records. So some risk management tips. Uh, it's important to establish a culture of compliance with the act, beginning with the agency leadership. Um, Staff need to be trained and officials need to be trained about the Act's requirements. It's good to review your procedures, see if they're current. Review available resources. My office is a resource. The Municipal Research Services Center is a resource. There's other good ones out there. And keep in mind those penalty factors. I mean, that's what the courts are going to look at if you get sued. Um, you know, were you honest? Did you have good procedures in place? Did you provide the fullest assistance? Um, was the request clear? If it wasn't clear, did you follow up and ask for clarity? And those are all the things that are going to come back to be reviewed. Um, keep updated on the current developments and, and apply the law consistently and correctly and consult with your agency's counsel if you're unclear. Um, Effective July 1, a new law went into effect um, that requires uh, records officers and um, agency officials to receive uh, training on the Public Records Act, the, the electeds, uh, and if, there's, uh, if they are part of a, a governing body subject to the Open Public Meetings Act, they also need to get Open Public Meetings training, as well as records management um, and retention training. Uh, it can take place earlier than July 1. Um, it has to, it must occur within 90 days of appointment, and then a refresher at least every four years, no later than four years. Um, as a practical matter, I would recommend maybe refreshers more often than that. You know, there's a lot that goes on in this area, uh, maybe at a yearly retreat or a yearly um, refresher course. The law allows training to be taken online. Um, the Secretary of State, State Archives has online tutorials. Our office has put online videos uh, on both open public records, uh, the, in terms of the Public Records Act. The records retention tutorials are the Secretary of State's um, um, uh, product. And then we have also have open government, um, open meetings training, and it's all on our new open government training page. I'm also available. Um, I am spread uh, thinner than I'd like to be right now, but um, people do call me, agencies, requesters, the media. Uh, my phone, my email is ringing off the hook all the time. 
Um, we've also published model rules. As I noted, we have an open government training page. Um, we're constantly putting new materials on there that are good tools. Um, and there's other resources out there. I've mentioned the Municipal Research Services Center is a good resource. So um, that is the basics. I, I did hand out, and I'm not going to go through it, um, this is a, actually an advanced Public Records Act training that I prepared for the Prosecuting Attorneys Association. Um, it goes through some of the cases and some other procedural requirements that the courts have put into play in some cases. Sort of ring the bell with you that I actually titled one section of this um, Examples of procedural steps you would not know by reading the PRA in 2014, meaning the courts have put layers, that whole search, all those search uh, criteria I put in for you, that's all case law. It's not in the Public Records Act. So I've outlined those for you in, in, in a chart format here. I've also put in a Q&A that's available on our website about the new open government training requirements and some contact information, both for Secretary of State's office and my office and uh, the recent legislation and some other things. So you can just sort of take that with you as a, as a more to come. So that pretty much uh, concludes the, the basic uh, training. I'm happy to answer any questions.